eight here get PhD from Yugoslavia. Afterwards, he continues postdoc in the Quantronics group. And from 2010, he working in the Institute of Physics. And he now has his own group. He lead it and he has two cryostat, one dry cryostat from Oxford. It's also very nice for me because I get some information about Oxford products and so on. And also one uh, <laughs> helium-free cryostat. And also from Oxford, that what I should say is that uh, for everybody that uh, VTT offer now helium-free cryostat. Who want to get it, you need to pay only for helium free. Okay, but let's go <laughs> to the topic. Okay. Bye. Yes, thank you very much, Alexander, for this nice introduction, and thank you for giving the opportunity to perform in front of you today. And I thank you all of you who joined my, my seminar. So I will talk about fast time resource method of temperature measurement at nanoscale. This is some some a pioneering method developed by me in my lab in Warsaw. So thus uh, it is aimed at monitoring the fast thermal transients which appear when you energize your nanostructure with current pulse and you know, uh, you need to know how fast it relax back to, to the equilibrium. So the, the main question that I pose in my studies is that the thermodynamics of nanostructure. So I will try to uh, show you in the uh, next minutes to, to actually how I can measure the temperature by um, how I can extract temperature, dynamic temperature of the nanostructure by measuring somewhat abstract uh, probability. So, okay, let me let me first display some there. So this is kind of inspiration or setting the problem or under study. So we have some physical body with heat capacity. This physical body is uh, in, in uh, some coupling, thermal coupling with a reservoir, but it is kept at elevated temperature, delta temperature above the buff temperature. So that now, if we allow to interact these bodies, so the rate of the uh, changes of the internal of energy of the body is given with the simple formula. So uh, that the rate is just proportional to the departure of the, from the, the Mm, above temperature uh, in the linear regime. And this is kind of very general, generic problem. So this can be, for example, electron subsystem, this can be phonon. So if we can, can distinguish two systems with two different temperature and one of them is at elevated temperature, we can always uh, analyze it within this, this simple expression. And if we, if we now, get solution for this simple differential equation, which is exponential in linear regime and the decay constant here is, is heat capacity of the body divided by, by its uh, thermal conductance with the environment. And now in, in nano, uh, nano world, these times, equilibration times at very low temperatures that can be easily much larger than 10 microseconds, 100 microseconds, but as, as we increase temperature, uh, they can be they can easily go below even okay 10 nanoseconds so the the range of, of possible relaxation times or, or dynamics of thermal processes is described with, uh, within this time so if we want to have access to the thermal dynamics in nanoscapes we really need to uh, to have a tool which would be able to follow our temperature of our system so the dynamics of our system at this time so this kind of question was posed already many, okay, many almost 20 years ago by Andrew Cleland. So he, he found that the, the thermodynamic studies are uh, they lack behind corresponding electrical and magnetic investigations, and he attributed this death to apparent lack of fast thermometers mm -hmm. that should be able to trace the, the variation of, of the temperature quickly. So then the the, the with this, with this having such, such tool, we could, we could dramatically increase the number of, of the thermal uh, thermal effects to be explored. So, what are possible the, the tech processes that I'm talking about? So, we know that electrons at low temperatures they are usual. They have their own temperatures. They are decoupled thermally of, from phonons, from from say electromagnetic temperature. So they can 
uh, increase their temperature by absorbing uh, photons. They can also lower their temperature by emitting photons. This is black body radiation. They can also change locally their temperature due to diffusion to regions of the of the lower temperature. So here we have the thermal conductivity plays a role. They can also exchange um, energy with phonons. So here we talk about electron phonon coupling. And phonons in the nanostructure, they don't need to have the same temperature as, as phonons in the substrate here, capizza resistance plexerol. And finally, once we excite these phonons in the substrate, they can then uh, go between the remote, between two nanostructures, which are galvan galvanically not connected, but they, 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 get, they can transport heat from one part of the nanostructure to other. So these are possible processes, fundamental processes that we, we can study. We want to study to know their dynamics. So we, I want to measure them in, in time domain. So what was uh, so far done that um, people mainly investigated these processes in steady state. So what by steady state, I mean that you apply some constant heating. Due to this, you obtain some distribution on temperature of the structure. But this is steady state temperature everywhere. And then by application of some thermal model, we are able to extract dynamical parameters. But this is not the same direct measurement of relaxation time. So for example, you can measure heat capacity, you can measure thermal uh, conductance from electron to phonons, and then you can say, OK, so, so my thermal uh, relaxation time is just the ratio of these two. So this is indirect method. But it, the, the idea is to, to get to measure this directly. So we need to measure heat flows in the dynamic thermal transient in nanosecond regime. OK. And then, OK, this is just example electron phonon coupling. So we have, we have again, this, this uh, wave packets, electrons here. Here are phonons. And uh, the, the in linear regime, the, this flow is, is proportional to the departure of temperature. So here, for example, we have this famous T to five formula for more normal matter. When we analyze it, we, we, we see that the, the thermal conductance is proportional to the power of temperature. So this kind of, okay, we can also measure this kind of thing. So afterwards, I, I will show you some data also uh, and that measuring of this, of this um, values. More generally, if we have thermometer, we, we can talk about calorimetry. So calorimetry is, uh, and as measuring of the heat associated with various, various physical processes. This can be um, phase transition. This can be determination of the heat capacity. That's how much heat you need to, to heat up or cool down the, the, the system. Uh, we, you can study, of course, with calorimetry mechanism of heat dissipation as, as displayed already. When you have calorimeter, you can say that this is the, the already the good building block for bolometry. So I would say that, my, that uh, the method that I develop is good for, um, it, it's kind of, it can be treated as a diagnostic tool for evaluating the performance of bolometers. So, so for example, you can very well characterize the dynamics of the absorber. And of course, then if, if the, the, the amount of absorbed energy is sufficiently high, this, this method could be also used for direct detection. So here I would also, so these are more kind of like on application side uh, related applied, to applied physics, but here it's, I would like to mention that, that, uh, that we need to understand thermal budget for failure free operation of nanocircuits. So here are, we talk about qubits, squids, microcoolers, bolometers, okay? So we know that more generally, if we talk about the variation of temperature, it is just a variation of quasi particles. It is some, some dynamics of quasi particles behind. So, more generally, so quasi particles, if they are non equilibrium, then we cannot talk about temperature, but, but still we, we can measure some dynamics. So, we know that these quasi particles, this spoil meteorological application of single electron boxes, uh, microcoolers. But for perhaps some that are very important for a normal operation of bolometers. I and mean, bolometers detects the, the, the incident radiation only because we created some quasi particles there. So sometimes they can be used to our advantage, sometimes we, we would like to avoid them. So 
There is discipline of phase coherent calorietronics, which is uh, developed by Francesco Giazotta, for example. So uh, it is aimed at um, instead of using electrical pulses, we would rather use heat, heat pulses. To, to demonstrate some number of devices, some number of functionalities. Okay, and this is the like warning that many quantum effects are of course mimicked by thermal effects. So if you don't understand the thermal budget of your nanostructure, then actually you can easily um, you can easily um, misinterpret your, your kind of quantum effects. So let me introduce my 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 main. Main tool that I use. This is superconducting aluminum nano bridge, which is called diode nano bridge. It is very simple uh, nanostructure, granular aluminum. Here, 60 nanometers uh, wide bridge presented, 30 nanometers thick. So it has, it has the typical critical current of 50 microns. So uh, in micronova facilities, you can do it easily 20 micrometers here, nanometers here, as, as Jonas Pelton and recently showed me. So, so you can, okay, that's uh, dependent here of, of, of what you need. You can you can vary the, 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 the critical current by varying geometry. So it is very simple. It is very robust also. It's difficult actually to burn it or destroy, uh, unlike the, the maybe tunnel junction. So it has very nice feature. Here, such bridge. This, this here, I present a few IB curves measure different um, buff temperatures. So, at uh, it has at low temperatures, it has pronounced supercurrent branch, me meaning that there is supercurrent flowing with no dissipation. And upon exceeding certain threshold, this bridge switches to the non-zero voltage state. And after, in in fact, this. After this switching, the dissipation in the running in the bridge is so overwhelming that it is it goes in temperature much above critical temperature. So this is overheated state. Here, bridge is in the normal state and it only retraps back when the temperature is sufficient, when, when the current is sufficiently lowered so that then uh, the electron phonon coupling provides mm -hmm. enough sync for this to come back to the superconducting state and you see that if we increase temperature there is uh, this supercurrent peak is smaller so by varying uh, but so from from this you, you perhaps have already the idea okay this is thermometer because I, I have pronounced sensitivity of my supercurrent peak high on the temperature so what to do to measure it in, in a more quantitative way is uh, variation so I am uh, Employ the switching measurement protocol. It, it, it consists of sending, say, 10,000 pulses on the bridge, and in response to each pulse, the bridge may, may uh, switch, then the voltage pulse develops on the bridge, or it may remain in superconducting state, then there is no pulse appearing. So you send some particular value of the current amplitude, and then you count number of times the junction switch. And then the number of times it's switched divided by total of number of pulses you, you broke gives you the what we call this is probability or more accurately this estimation for the switching probability. It would be probability if we send really infinite number of pulses, but now we get um, we get estimation. And so this is how we characterize this is the switching probability, which is the main parameter which I use in. In my measurements, always I measure this switching probability, and then I can uh, get idea about temperature, about all possible responses by measuring this. Okay, so here just quickly to restate what, what I told. So we, we send, suppose, one, one current uh, level amplitude, which is at much above switching threshold. So we see that in response to each probing, um, pulse junction switches. So in this case, we conclude, okay, that my switching probability is one. So we have this point. If on the other hand, we work much below threshold, it's of course in response to no n of these probing pulses, we have switching zero here, no, no voltage pulses. Then we conclude that this is probability, switching probability zero. But in between, we have some region 
which which is stochastic in nature, which, which means that for a, this particular value of the current amplitude, junction may switch, but it doesn't need to switch. So it's purely this is this is like throwing a coin, tossing a coin. So you toss coin and you count how many times you obtain tail or, or head. And from measurement to measurement, your result is different, but in, in if you have sufficiently many measurements, okay, let's say 10,000 is already a good number, you, you can tell the switching probability at this point quite accurately. So now, okay, so this was explanation of the switching, but how what it will, how how it's it will, how, how we can apply it for the moment. So as you can measure switching, okay, so, so switching curve, just some, some more uh, introduction. So here, this, this is called S curve. So uh, this is the S curve is the pro, um, probing current dependence of the switching probability. So obviously it, 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 it executes this non-trivial uh, region when, when the switching has stochastic character, and this is where we want to work. So now if we just keep testing current constant, but we sweep temperature, we also can record such as that. So this is now the switching probability as a function of the uh, swept uh, temperature here. So you see here, this, these are data obtained with my triton. So I can give challenge Alexander to you and, and try to obtain such stability with your force. So you see I here I sweep uh, in steps of two milli k. So we see that the, the actual Oxford is I'm, I must appreciate Oxford data for excellent temperature stability. So the, these are steps of two milli k. These are experimental data here. We have really done them error, actually error. So I could do it even better. So this already you can consider that this is your calibration curve. Yes. So whenever you measure such probability, okay, this is such temperature. And at the moment we are talking about some equilibrium. Equilibrium thermometer. So one way is to, to measure variation of probability with temperature, but you can also do kind of globally look at the problem. I mean, you can measure critical kind of switching current at the junction, which is very close to critical because the, the critical current is huge. So switching current is very close to the critical one. So then you measure this kind of uh, critical current dependence on temperature. So also you can uh, treat it as a calibration curve. So whenever you tell that, okay, I measure 110, I have such temperature, yes, so this is a calibration curve. By the way, this is some depression here. So this this kind of usual, this, this bridges, you, you can describe them with uh, Ambega Akbarat of uh, formula for which is here displayed for tunnel junction, but it, it works also well for, for these junctions because for, for these bridges, because they, in fact, they consist of many not so well transmitting channels. So it can be shown by the general theory that if you plot it, that actually is very, very close to tunnel junction. I mean, that if you have a transmission 0.7 from point of view of, of the, the, the uh, theory, it will look very similar to tunnel junction. But okay, so this is just. Uh, that we can describe within this, this kind of junction formula. So now let's measure S curves for the uh, different temperatures. So here I change buff temperature for, from 100 to above 800 millik in steps of 5 millik. So these are experimental data. And th this can be considered as a kind of full calibration of my thermometer. So now let's stack these curves side by side. To build the, the color map, probability map. So here on, on the vertical axis, we have the testing current. So the current that we sent to probe the uh, bridge. Here we have electron temperature. So you see that there are regions which are kind of trivial. So switching probability here, this brown region is one. Here, this light region is zero. But in between, there is interesting region, this stripe here where the probability is neither zero nor one. And this is where we want to work. So now that for this color, if we take vertical cut of this map, it is the simple S curve. So you see here is zero, then we climb here up and then it's one, yes? So I just put the, the S curve side by side. So now if we 
Suppose are here, so we test that the, the our bridge with this 52 micro amps, and it, it corresponds to certain temperature, and we have some. Okay, that now is, and we slightly change the temperature, so we see that as we change temperature, the probability is increased. Yes, from PA is this is a index A and to, to PB. So this is this mode I call that this is the temperature determined from probability. But we can also keep the, uh, the same probability. We can say that we want the temperature increase, but we, we now want to check how much the testing current must change to keep the same probability. So then you see that this corresponds to such change in the testing uh, testing current. So this 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 method I would call this is like the temperature from the from that from probability and from time. So we have these two methods. One is nice in, in linear regime because it addresses all the departures uh, of from the equilibrium temperature um, of the order of a uh, few tens of milli K. So you, you stay somewhere with because you use the constant current, so you can't allow really for big departure because you the, the, it's very sensitive. And here I plotted the, the um, inverse of the temperature responsivity. So it tells how much the, the probability changes in, in response to change in electron temperature. So you see that this responsivity is the, the actually the best because this is inverse, it is the best at higher temperature. And for this particular bridge, it's, it's, it's in, the bridge stops to be sensitive, say below 300 millimeter. And this is the second method. So here is temperature probability. We keep testing current constant and we just measure variation of probability. And here we, on the other hand, we keep probability constant and we check how much we have to adjust the switching current to, to keep this probability. So now, so far, I, I kind of, was, this was the, the kind of principle of the equilibrium thermometry. So you, you have system and equilibrium that the, the, you send your pass and you probe it. Uh, there is no any dynamics yet. So how to introduce dynamics? So we use the, the idea familiar from pump and probe, um, pump and probe laser physics. So we energize our nanostructure with the, the, the uh, some short heating pulse, which is intended to just to, to elevate electron temperature slightly, sometimes it can be a lot of one part of the nanostructure. And then in some other place, we send the testing plug where we have junction, we test testing pulse on this junction. And this testing pulse is delayed with respect to heating pulse by some, okay, this, this delay value. And now the this that the switching current or probability for given switching current at this delay will tell us what is the instantaneous temperature just um, at, at this moment after application of the heating pulse. And then, so of course, to get single point, we need to send 10,000 such sequences. And uh, then we increase delay again, we send 10,000 sequences. And this is the, the way how we reconstruct the, the temperature profile. So the method addresses perfectly repeatable thermal processes, which can be restarted many times with the same initial condition. So you, you have to reset everything, you energize, and then sometime later, you ask, what is your temperature? And then you have to repeat it for slightly larger delay and to, to, to obtain to render the full uh, temporal profile. So the method resolution is, is limited by tau. Tau for, for the best uh, arbitrary way from the generators available in the market is 100 picoseconds. And I use the, the one which is the resolution the, the level of a few nanoseconds. So I can say that, but it should work also well with this, the, the fastest available. So here is the, the um, some some like 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 the proof of concept experiment. So what we do here, we we switch the the bridge, and then this bridge relaxes to the, the mm, to the buff temperature. Uh, so the the we have bridge 
connected to superconducting nanowire once we switch it to the full wires in, in normal state and now it cools down and we observe the temperature that we observe the switching current of the uh, of the bridge as it cools down with this pump and pro protocol so here we have cooling time here is switching time so you see that the first point that we can measure, they are here maybe 25 nanoseconds after sending the heat impulse because we need to provide some time for bridge actually to come back to the, the superconducting state and only then mm, mm, the method starts uh, to work. So we see here progressive recovery of the switching current and then the, by thus associating with our equilibrium calibration, the switching current with temperature, we can rewrite uh, rewrite this data, recalculate them in terms of the temperature, temporal profile. And this is here the, the fitting of, of um, heat flow equations, uh, which mainly takes into account electron uh, quantum coupling mechanism of relaxation. Also, some uh, hot electron diffusion plays a role. But this is highly nonlinear because you see here we go from like 1k to 300 milli k. So our parameters are functions, they are not just some values because these are here. We have to take into account the capacity, thermal conductivity, electron phonon coupling, which are temperature dependent. So it is uh, highly nonlinear process. And a gap, I guess. Or is it, is it superconducting gap changing here also? Yes, also superconducting gap changes. Yes, also. You, 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 it's also taken into account here. I thought. So I have this, this equation in the end, so I can also show afterwards. So here you, you, you can measure this, this um, also this, this linear regime. Again, we have the same wire, but what we do, we, we measure the uh, changes in, in uh, temperature in our regime as a function of, of yes, this delay or cooling time. So you see that if, if uh, th this is measured as, as a kind of Tail of this relaxation here. Yeah. Yes, so that's we, we focus on, on this tail. So, and you see that the, 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 this kind of uh, exponential model works here quite well. So, at the, at, as, as we increase uh, temperature, the relaxation uh, times become faster and faster. These are the same data, but in, in uh, this highly nonlinear regime. So here we can study this probability mode. So these are data calculated from measuring probability. So you see here we can measure departures of 10, 20 mK from the, the base temperature. But here we can measure okay almost 1K. And this is, I mean, the, the, these data are just, are just the last parts of here on the on this of this um, temperature traces recalculated from switching current. Okay, and if you take this relaxation times from here, now you can plot uh, plot them here on the SF. So we have relaxation time of aluminum as a function of temperature. And here I imposed the, the, um, the linear regime uh, model data, uh, taking it, it, into account only electron phonon coupling in superconducting state. So this is this is linearized uh, electron phonon conductance, and this is the heat capacity of aluminum. So we see that actually at here that the times that they measure are 30 nanoseconds at higher temperatures. So here it's this good agreement. Here it's, it's it looks like the electron phonon coupling is actually works better than theory than BCS theory predicts. Or maybe I, I should also take into account here the, the hot electron diffusion. So, okay, so these were experiment main, the previous experiment was mainly aimed at kind of proof of concept and then uh, also to, to investigate electron phonon coupling. So the, now let's focus on another process. So the, I described kind of this one, relaxation due to this process mainly, but now let's, let's design some experiment in which we could test this relaxation channel. So this is hot electron diffusion. So we consider following example. We have here copper ion heater, and uh, we uh, energize this heater ion by sending here. Here, this is grounded. So we send here heating pulse, which is say okay, five nanoseconds long. We create non-equilibrium 
population of quasi particles here. So they start to diffuse through this neck into superconducting wire. These this, uh, red dots are, are part of this, this quasi particles depicted schematically. And 60 micrometers away here, we have superconducting bridge, um, which is our temperature sensor. So, what we expect that, okay, here is the same photo of the heater. So, you expect that. Directly after the, the you created these quasi particles, they need, of course, some time to arrive at the, at the junction. So you expect some time delay because this is diffusive movement. So you, you should not signal, see signal immediately. So you expect this is like free particle diffusion model. So you expect that here the population of them, if you have no any dissipation of, I mean, no, not annihilation of quasi particles, it should go down exponentially. This is just evolving Gaussian distribution. But here on this on this tail, it should be first zero and then it should pick up and come back. So this is what, what is measured in experiment. So here is the timing of experiment display heating pulse, testing pulse delay. Here is the same delay. Here is linear scale, here is logarithmic scale. So zero corresponds to moment delays counted with respect of the onset of the heating pulse. So this is a moment when two pulses overlap and they create a cross. Mm -hmm. So you, you may say that, okay, the, you, you see one pulse through another one, so it provides also the good mean for time, uh, time, uh, time temporal time duration of experiment. But then indeed you see for first 30 nanoseconds, you don't see, see this is the, the base level. So this is the constant testing current mode. So I measure only variation of probability. So, and then the, the signal starts to go, go up. It picks up after 300 nanoseconds and goes back to, uh, goes back to equilibrium. Okay, here also you see these are data recorded for two polarization of the heating parts. So just to show that it's a really thermal effect. Yes, so like if you have Electrical effects usually, like you see here, is the change of pro, uh, the, the because you reverse the polarity of the pulse. This, this in the cross step is also reversed, but this is thermal effect. So here we can recalculate with our calibration procedures that I was describing the data into um, excess electron temperature at the bridge. So you see that. With the increase of the buff temperature the, and using the same heating power, the mm, the curves, this diffusive, these are diffusive profiles of uh, electrons recorded at the junction. They become smaller and smaller, so signal is becoming more and more suppressed. And this is so at only 600 millicase is much less pronounced at, at 400. And if you take into account modeling, then uh, you will find that this is due to uh, still increasing role of electron phonon coupling and also due to increased heat uh, capacity, electron heat capacity. So simply these electrons diffusing from the, the heater to, to, to bridge, they are annihilated on the way. So at higher temperature, this is a combination rate, annihilation rate is much better. So you, you can't, okay, finally there are only a few of them arriving. And this is also here, you, you have also, if you just take this off onset, this should you give you the idea if you use free particle diffusion model and take the, the, the diffusion constant okay, normal state. If you know mean free path in your wire, you expect uh, for these structures is 20, 30 nanometers. Here is Fermi velocity, and you have here Einstein small Kopsky law of diffusion. Uh, so for 60 micrometers. From source to 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 to, 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 to the sensor, we expect uh, we expect uh, um, such time. So because it is that I mean that the maximum time of arrival is is in agreement with what what we expect with the simple model of free particle diffusion. So okay, okay, and and these are fits so made with full because we. We'll, Okay, with full one dimensional heat flow equation. So it takes into account uh, electron phonon coupling, uh, thermal, uh, thermal conductivity. Photons are not included, but this is too high temperature. 
And here are data. Just here, I would like to advertise that metal is, is not only perfectly uh, provides not only perfect temporal resolution, but also very nice uh, temperature vertical resolution. So this is still diffusive profile measured at 800 mini k. This red curve here, and you see the, that peak is only 400 microkelvin high, and with blur of at the level of 100 microkelvin. So not not only nice temporal but also temperature resolution. We can also test steady states. So here is the experiment that we send the pulse, the probing pulse delayed with respect of the onset of the heating pulse. And then now heating pulse is very long, so we can see progressive development of the steady state. So we see, for example, here we see that the, the, okay, the temperature goes, goes up, up, and after one microsecond, it, the system arrives to steady state. So we can know how fastly the steady state develops. We can also check how fast it comes back to, to equilibrium after the, the some heating was switched off. So now delay is set with respect to the end of the, of the heating pulse. And we see that, okay, after we switched off, it goes back here maybe after. Okay, three uh, microseconds. And again, this is the same one dimensional uh, heat flow equation. So it properly captures the same parameters, properly captures both the, the, the dynamic and uh, steady state um, properties. So here also, I would like to show that. To, to that we don't only need to measure the slow processes, we can also measure the fast process, also some very slow processes. So here, what I did, I, I switched the, the bridge, and then I measured the, the relaxation of the bridge after the single switching. So you see here is the relaxation of the level, it is at five uh, temperature surface, it's at 500. Mini case of relaxation is at the level of one microsecond. This is mainly electron phonon relaxation. So it is the time that it takes for electrons to come back to equilibrium of phonons. But if you now send 600 switching passes, so this is forced switching. So we really pump a lot of energy. You can consider that this is either this is just one long heating pass. And now we measure again the relaxation. So you see two relaxations. One is fast. And another is slow one. The slower one is thousand times slower than the, the first one. So the, the, the first process is exactly the same like this one. You see 1.4, 1.3 microseconds. So this is again time for for uh, for uh, for electrons to equilibrate with phonons, with local phonons in the nanostructures. But these phonons are locally are overheated, and then it takes for them a lot of time really to come back to the equilibrium. So it's now the relaxation time is here one millisecond. So it also shows this measurement that, that okay, in, this, in steady states, uh, very often that we make assumptions as phonons are all not overheated. And all, of course, it depends how much you leave on heat there. But uh, if you overheat phonon subsystem, it may take much longer for uh, to do equilibrate the test. So you see here, this is my scales. This is what I would like to advertise. People usually put here on, on as a relaxation time linear scale. I put always logarithmic scale. So we have four orders of magnitude. And in fact, I could measure here another two orders of magnitude. So I have six orders of magnitude here. So and also pay attention that please pay attention that this is, I mean, if you have any discrepancy between theory and experiment, if you use logarithmic scale. It's, it's more difficult yes, to do. So for example, if I plot this in linear scale here, the agreement between theory and experiment would be perfect. But logarithmic scales magnifies all possible discrepancies. OK, and now okay, these are some technical things, responsivity and nice equivalent temperature, but it is a bit, a bit interesting uh, also. So and, uh, here is the inverse of the temperature responsivity. This is what I told you. So it tells us how much the probability of the junction changes in response to change of electron temperature. And measuring this, you can define noise equivalent temperature. So 
Now we want to know actually what is to, to arrive to this figure of merit. You need to know what is the accuracy of your probability measurement because this, this is your noise equivalent temperature. So this is like probability, the, the change in probability. So we see that from here we could extract the, the smallest resolvable temperature variation change measure. So then, then now to answer the question, what is the smallest uh, smallest uh, probability variation that, that, that you can measure? We now call this analogy. This is experimental data measured for junction. That this is tossing a coin. So just toss a coin ten thousand times. Count number of heads, toss it again, and perhaps you got not not uh, the same number, not 4,800, but maybe this time 4,950, and another time 5,005. So each time you repeat this experiment, you get slightly different number. And the broadening, so this is exactly what I did here. I, I just mm, toss my coin, my junction 10,000 times, and, and measured how many. Uh, outcomes I got. Then I repeated it yeah, again and again, and then I could give histogram. And you see that there is really the, the, the broadening of, of this histogram is described with binomial distribution. So binomial distribution sets us the uh, accuracy of determination of the of the probability being given a finite number of the probing pulses. So if you increase number of probing pulses, this, this binomial distribution stands to, to the okay, Dirac delta. I mean, this would be just vertical here, but as you read, read this is like a, in analogy, as you measure per square root hertz, the longer you measure, the better result you get, yes? So you are able to average out more, more, more frequency components. But here, the, the role of this frequency is just number of pulses. So, uh, so this is the, the actual number that we have to insert here. So you can consider that this plays a role of, I call it statistical noise. It's not electrical noise. It is just measurement statistically limited. Because you see that I can measure really it obeys that this histogram obeys the, the <coughs> statistical limit. Of course, if you now increase number from 10,000 to 1 million, perhaps you start to be limited by, because I, I can't imagine that I would get finally, of course, here there. Uh, direct delta. So example, noise equivalent temperature, 10 millikelvin per square root of N, 10 here, which is the biggest figure of uh, the best figure of Mary, with N equal 10,000 pulses. If you put it here, it <coughs> gives you uncertainty in temperature determination of 100 microkelvin. So this is also what I could kind of independently see here. This is what I was telling you, yes? Just look how much it is black. It's roughly 100 microkelvin. Okay, so these are this, this technical. And now, okay, we'll just really uh, two more slides. So this is kind of fundamental. As you may ask, and people uh, ask often this question, what a guy are actually measuring? Because you, you measure some dynamical thermal transients, and this, your temperature a properly defined thermodynamical quantity. Uh, shouldn't you rather tell about some effective temperature, some instantaneous temperature? Why, why you tell this is thermodynamic temperature? Do you have right to do it? Yes. And so, so in literature, if you study, you have like two approaches, I found. One is thermal approach, which I would say uh, Yuka uh, Pecola likes. Uh, that, I mean that, that uh, talking about evolution of some dynamics also in, the, in terms of, of you define temperature for actons, phonons, and you can you can talk about the, the variation of this temperature. And uh, another is some people say they prefer to so one, one you say uh, like you can you can you can uh, the quantity under studies temperature we talk about electron temperature. And another is uh, is is. Um, then another approach would be actually the, the investigation of the changes of the number of quasi particles, or if somebody would be more uh, more orthodox, would we investigate the changes of the of the quasi particles at, at given energies. So in principle, here you have one dimensional heat flow equation which describes the, the, the diffusion of temperature. 
So this is the thermodynamic equation with parameters electron thermal conductivity, heat capacity, and electron uh, power flow. And this is some heating term. But you can also talk about diffusion of the, the quasi, quasi particles, the number of quasi particles here. And here we have some recombination factors and some uh, that they are responsible for annihilation of quasi particles. So this method seems to be more general because here you can, in principle, consider you don't need to talk about temperature. So temperature is only well defined. If you can talk about that your quasi particles are, are described according to some Fermi Dirac function, yes. Uh, but if in general the, they, they are not populated according to Fermi Dirac, then you, you would rather try to use this equation. But the point here with this equation is that you see that here these rays, they are, these are averaged rays. Diffusion constant is also averaged. So in this equation, you don't see Usually, there is no energy energy dependence written on of quasi particles. And diffusion constant, for example, in DCS theory, should be energy dependent. So, in the end, these equations are they also kind of phenomenological? So, it's, it's I mean, you can you can kind of pretend that you play on some microscopic level, really, but but it, it would be very difficult now to, to solve it. To, to put here the energy dependence. So my point is following that, of course, it should be perhaps possible to rewrite this equation in terms of that one. And I, I, I was actually trying to, to find that there's some, some, some clues in literature, because diffusion is like thermal conductivity. Uh, the combination uh, electro, uh, electrons are uh, recombined into two purpose because they emit phonons. But also they can heat up colder electrons, colder quasi particles. So this is accounted in heat capacity. So somehow this should involve these two terms. Yes. So obviously it's it's um, this must be linked. But if you study papers, you will find other people focus on this description or on this one. And then these guys they criticize the dogs that okay, but you don't have the, the equilibrium temperature. So what I can tell about my my data. That here again you see the profile uh, or that, that I displayed already. So this is diffusing profile of quasi particle as they pass at the nano bridge. So there is quite nice uh, dynamics after 300 nanoseconds you have this peak. And what we do, we now measure at this each of these points A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We measure at this particular delay, we measure S curve. So this I call dynamic S curve. And also, I can measure S curve at it's in equilibrium state when there is no any dynamics going. So I measure a different buff temperature from 400, 402, 406, 8, 10, 412, 414. So I measure these curves. And now it turns out that for for each dynamic curve, I can find the made from on the from the static from this equilibrium S curve. And here I impose two families on each other. And you see that this dynamic s curves they look exactly the same as the static s curves So my point is that if we believe that the shape of s curve is governed by the, the um, population of quasi-particles in the bridge, then if we get the same s curve in equilibrium and during this dynamic thermal transient, that it means that, that during this thermal transients also electrons are well described with uh, Fermi Dirac distribution. And we can actually talk that this is not effective temperature, but we can talk that what we measure is really thermodynamical temperature. OK, so my summary. So I, I uh, you can monitor fast thermal transients in time domain with switching thermometry, it delivers nanosecond resolution, and this good accuracy. This is not optimized accuracy. So I would say this is two orders of magnitude improvement over the state of the art uh, other methods of mesoscopic thermometry because so uh, the, the competitive scheme, which okay of course has many advantages over my technique, but is not so fast in, in general. Would be putting the thermometer into some some resonator microwave resonator. 
and then probing this resonator, you can see the variation of temperature in the real time domain. But still, I mean, I, I don't believe you can go to say to, to below one on second with, with, with this method. Uh, so, okay. And what is important to state that the method is applicable to all Josephson junctions that exceed hysteresis. It can be thermal hysteresis or it can be hysteresis resulting from the running state in tilted washboard potential. So you can use some proximity junctions like this, this uh, niobium silver. Uh, niobium would be very good, for example, for to study below 300 mK. So I, I saw some work from, from Marco recently, so I was very happy that this is temperature depends on the critical current. Also proximity junctions are, are known to be very sensitive at lower temperatures. On the other hand, some niobium junctions would allow you to extend towards high temperatures. So the end point is that I think that this method is, is of, of probing with pulses is, 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 is full of huge potential and can offer us a lot of interesting experiments, which are also many of them I'm currently doing. <laughs> yes, so hopefully next time I'll be able to share with you also. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Martin, for a very nice yes. presentation. And okay, you can. Uh, uh, yeah, two questions. The first one you showed this noise equivalent temperature, just like square root of over square root of n. Essentially. Yes. So, yes. what is your uh, time for repeating ten thousand pulses to get this? I so so so, so this is ten thousand pulses. It's two seconds. Okay. So this is uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, but, but this depends on the if you want to be sure that because uh, the one pulse is oh, two hundred microseconds. You can try to do it faster, mm. but then you. Okay, so 200 microseconds multiplied by 10,000 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, you can measure temperature with a time two second time resolution in uh, real time, right? Uh, uh, yes, in this, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Of course, the question is now that there are some applications that you can mm -hmm. measure just with single shot, but it is for detection. Yes. Of, so if you optimize, maybe you can use. Uh, yeah, but this this method, in principle, as as I presented it, this is it relies on the measurement of the probability, and to measure probability, yeah. measurement of probability involves playing with the ensemble of yeah. the this yeah. systems yeah. in exactly the yeah. same way. So it will it, it 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 gives you insight into perfectly repeatable mm -hmm. thermal processes. Yes. Right. So I don't want to claim that. Yeah, yeah, because there's kind of two different. Uh, Speeds of a thermometer. I mean, if you're yes. looking at some random processes, yes. you can't say that you have this time resolution. No, but no. If, you, if you repeat no. synchronously something, then you can say that you yes, can yes. follow it. Oh, yes, yes, exactly. So this is the switching thermometer means that this is like probabilistic thermometer when you measure a probability. Yes, so this is the point. No, another question there is that is it really measuring the quasi particle uh, population at this? Uh, Brits, or is, is there some contribution also from far away? So you see, I think that the, the to big extent you have ex, ex, uh, answered here, yes. Because you see here, I, I energize, but this is really strong overheating of the heater here. And now here is nothing, you don't see anything. So, so I would say that, that, that this bridge is, is uh, also when, when you take, the, the, take simulations and we use some orthodox model of thermal activation, because it has so strong uh, critical current, it's governed more, more, more by the local property. Mm -hmm. So if you calculate it's, it's switching current, it is uh, based on that, on the um, fear of switching of this, okay, this model, you know. Yes, you use these formulas. So then you find that it's actually very, very close to critical current. So my point is that the, the uh, bridge, this bridge is sensitive to local population of quasi particles. Tunnel junction is um, uh, perhaps more sensitive to do this kind of environmental effects. Yeah, surprisingly, there also it's mainly. Usually the local temperature. Yes, yes, yes. So, so I, I think that it's possible to, to, to 
uh, with properly taking care of the the, the, the environment is but but I, I would say that environmental effects are, are negligible so even even yes of course because here is this yes it, it this is completely silent here so it shows that I mean here would it should be some some I heat it environment but it doesn't see it as long as quasi particle really when they arrive to the junction only then I see it. But this can be that, that uh, yes, the, 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 the one explanation would be that, that, that the critical current is much, is so huge that it's 50 microns, mm -hmm. yes. So it's orders of magnitude higher than, than in typical tunnel junction. But still, it's, 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 I, I think that, that it's, it's possible to, to kind of, uh, uh, yes, take away this. This is also, Okay, this may be interesting for that. Mm -hmm. The S curve width, if you measure, this is S curve width broadening mm -hmm. of the of the. Uh, so you, what you see here, people, the kind of orthodox people would say, here is MQT, here is thermal activation, here is phase diffusion. Mm -hmm. But the point is that okay, if you try to fit it, here you have. Okay, so here is. S curve 300 milli k, but it can be fitted with escape temperature 750. This is 500 milli k, it can be fitted with 1.8 k. This is 750, it can be fitted with almost 6 k. So it's, it's uh, but I have found also in, in uh, Markov paper that you have also quite, quite uh, different values. So, but then let's try to. See, this is the fitted escape temperature as a function of temperature. So you see here is the, the, the imperfect world when we have the escape temperature equal to above, it should be here. But what I see is first strongly diverging and going down. So it is, you can't even tell that this is that I have a problem with noise because if it was noise, it should, should Converge here to the, I mean, the noise effect should be less pronounced at higher temperature. So, which, as I go up with in temperature, I should get better agreement of this theory. But here, here really diverges. So, what ingredient is missing? I, I, I think that this, these bridges are, are the, the, what you see. Uh, maybe thermal activation is there, but for sure there are some much more pronounced effects which, which are completely not uh, kind of omitted. Because people were focusing on tunnel junctions, and this is the equation actually to, to, to do this. So I think that it has something to in common with the fluctuation of the critical current of Andrea bound states. So here we see, you see another curve. So these are different types of testing. So this also this probing with pulses opens you the way to do actually to get dynamics which was not previously. Available. So you see here is that this peak depends on the testing time. And moreover, if you take the, the switching current dependence on temperature, at these peaks, you have some kinks on this curves. You see there's but well, there are a lot of mysteries. <laughs> okay, here is another question similar. So here I measured I have two bridges, one is Heliox. And then under the striton, so I measure on two setups. So you see I have very good agreement of data here. Okay, here is already the, the triton has problem to stabilize above like all the illusion fridges around 1k. Yeah, but this is you need to stabilize really with accuracy of, of 2 milli k. So try to do it with blue force. It's possible. But usually, but usually, people are, are not because it is extremely sensitive. So they are yeah, ever get to at, at the temperatures. It, I, I told to show you this temperature responsivity. So at, I mean here already you see this is it starts to be weird. So when as you approach, you see you get bigger and bigger sensitivity. Yeah, you are also very happy with blue force treaties. No, no, I'm also yeah, very yeah, happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then we are happy. I'm also very yeah. happy, but, but this is just challenge, challenge. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is the equation. So I take into in the, my solution, I take into account the, the numerically calculated electron phonon coupling from this double integral. 
and uh, for thermal uh, uh, conductivity is also this kind of integral that okay, you know very well. This is, yes, I found this integral in UK papers. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just calculated it. And this is what showed up, and I, then I put it here. So, so uh, then it's, it's you see, but the, the evolution is highly nonlinear because all of this depends on, on, on the temperature. So then it's really difficult. Even I, I don't make fits, I just put it. And okay, because it would be, I would need, need to manipulate with these functions if I measure it in one direction. More questions? From audience. No, I, I think that they can freely turn on their their microphone. So, so. Hello, uh, is there any further question? No. no. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yes. So I, I would like to thank also. No, no. Ah, no, no. no, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, I would like to thank. Uh, yes, to Alexander, because he was uh, really the uh, first person who, who took me to this subject and was at first time contact in Baskeland and, and also he is the author of majority of my papers because always I can rely on his expertise and uh, strong experience, so he, I really appreciate and also I appreciate that I can come here from time to time and uh, yes, to, to talk with people from Alto because we have a lot of experience and I'm in Poland uh, kind of uh, alone in, in this investigation because this is not, not, it was not discipline that was developed in Poland over the past years. So for me, such contact is very, very important. So thank you very much. <laughs>